Welcome to this next video in the playlist on vector spaces. In this video, what we're going to discuss is finite dimensional vector spaces. Okay, so we're firstly going to define what is actually meant by a finite dimensional vector space. Then what we'll do is prove that all finite dimensional vector spaces have a basis. So we'll prove that you can always find a basis for a finite dimensional vector space. And then what we'll prove is that uh, the number of elements in a basis for a finite dimensional vector space is always going to be the same. So if you have some finite dimensional vector space and you have two bases of that finite dimensional vector space, the number of vectors in those uh, bases is going to be the same. Okay, so that will be the sort of the main proof that we want to uh, do in this video, and then we'll define what then is actually meant by the dimension of a finite dimensional vector space, uh, and finally we'll end with the proof that the dimension of a subspace of a finite dimensional vector space is going to be less than or equal to the dimension of the uh, initial space. Okay, right. Uh, so firstly then, let's just do the setup. So let's draw our normal picture of a vector space, okay, uh, just for a warm-up. Okay, so uh, we'll have a vector space, capital V, which is over some arbitrary field, capital F. So we're keeping this completely general. We've got some arbitrary vector space, which is called capital V, over some arbitrary field, capital F. Okay, right, so to draw a picture of this then, the vector space starts its life off as just a simple set of symbols. Okay, so I'll draw this set of symbols firstly. So this box then is going to represent the set of symbols that is going to form the vector space. So it will be called capital V. Okay, and you'll have lots of symbols in this set and those symbols will be called the vectors in the vector space. Okay, so to elevate this then from being uh, just a set of symbols to being some interesting algebraic structure, what we need to do is define algebraic composition laws on top of this set of symbols. Okay, and for a vector space, uh, we're going to define two composition laws. Okay, the, so the first uh, composition law that we're going to define is called addition, and this is a composition law that involves elements of the vector space being added to other elements of the vector space. Okay, so it's a composition of vectors with other vectors. Okay, uh, so what you'll do quite simply is you'll give every single vector in the vector space a row in this addition composition table here. So you'll put them all down here, give every single one a row, and you'll give all of the vectors in the vector space a column. So you'll put them all up here, giving them all a column in this composition table. Okay, and then what uh, you'll have is a entry in this great table here corresponding to the addition of any combination of two vectors. Okay, so if you want to add one vector to another vector, the way that you look that up in this addition table is you just take the row corresponding to the first vector, so let's consider v plus v bar. Okay, so this is little v plus little v bar. What you do is take the row corresponding to little v here. Okay, so I'll colour this in. So here is little v's row, okay, and I'll colour it in in pink here. And then you take the column corresponding to little v bar, so let's say this is the column corresponding to little v bar, and we'll have that in in green here, okay, and then where they intersect here, this entry in the great table, that will be the answer to what these two added together is equal to. So in that little entry, you'll have some element of the vector space, which will be the answer as to what v plus v bar is equal to. So this table will tell you what any two vectors in the vector space added together is equal to. Okay, now that table uh, can't just be arbitrary. It has to obey a whole bunch of beautiful properties which make it interesting to actually study, and those properties can be summarized up by saying that this needs to obey the axioms of an abelian group composition law. Okay. Uh, so that's the first composition that we define on top of our vector space. Okay, now to elevate this then up from being an abelian group to actually being a full-on vector space over the field capital F, we need a second composition law on this set of symbols, and this second composition law is called scalar multiplication.
Okay, and we'll colour in the scale and multiplication composition table, I think, in yellow. Okay, and this one's a little bit more complicated because this doesn't involve composition of uh, a vector with a vector. Instead, it's going to involve composition of some symbol from the field with some vector. Okay, so we call elements of the field scalars, so we can say it involves the composition of a scalar with a vector. Okay, so what you'll quite simply do is you'll put all of the elements of your field algebra here, okay, uh, so you'll give every single one of them a row in this scalar multiplication composition table, like so, uh, and then uh, you'll put all of the vectors up here, so all of the vectors in the vector space will be given a column in this scalar multiplication composition table, and then if you want to know what any element of the field scalar multiplied by any vector in the vector space is, Okay, so if you want to know what little c times little v is equal to, uh, where little c is an element of the field and little v is an element of the vector space, quite simply you look up this in this scalar multiplication composition table by taking the row corresponding to little c here, so likewise I'll colour code it in, so we'll have this in red here, okay, and you take the column corresponding to little v here, so let's say that this is the column corresponding, whoops, uh, to the element v in our vector space, and I'll cover that in, in turquoise, and then where these two intersect, that entry in the great table, uh, that will have the answer to what these two things multiplied together is equal to, and all of the answers will be other elements of the vector space, so not elements of the field, elements of the vector space. Okay, and that has to obey a whole bunch of beautiful axioms as well. It has to be closed, so all of the answers in this table have to be elements of the vector space. Uh, the scalar multiplication has to associate with field multiplication. Uh, the multiplicative identity of the field has to multiply by all vectors to give that vector back again. And finally, it has to obey two interesting distributivity laws, okay? So four axioms overall that it must obey, and if you want more information about those, see the video on definition of a vector space, and they're in this playlist. Okay, right, so there's our warm-up. We now have our nice picture of a vector space ready for us to work with. Okay, so let's go now straight into the definition of what is meant by a finite dimensional vector space. What is the definition then of a finite dimensional vector space? So a vector space of V over F is going to be called a finite dimensional vector space if uh, there exists some subset of the vector space which is finite, okay, and which spans the entire vector space. Let me write this out. So there needs to exist capital S, which is a subset of capital V, um, uh, where, okay, so I'll put where, the order of capital S is finite, so it has a finite number of vectors in, okay? Uh, so we can write then out capital S uh, explicitly then, so capital S is going to just be a set of vectors from the vector space, so let's just write it out, let's say it contains these vectors v1, v2, and it's going to contain a finite number of vectors, so we'll go all the way up to vn. Okay, so to make this absolutely explicit, let me put them on this picture here. So in the vector space then, we're going to have a bunch, loads and loads of symbols. Okay, and I've taken a finite number of them, V1, V2, all the way up to Vn, okay, where n is some positive integer, some natural number. Okay, and I've stuck those into this set, uh, and that's my subset of the vector space, which is finite. Okay, so there must exist a subset of the vector space which is finite, okay, such that, okay, so such that the span of S is equal to the entire vector space. Okay, that is the definition of uh, a finite dimensional vector space. So if you can find a finite subset of the vector space capital V, um, which spans the entire vector space, then you can say that your vector space is a finite dimensional vector space. Okay, now let me just make absolutely clear what I mean by the span of a set capital S. Okay, so the definition of the span of the set capital S means the set containing all linear combinations of the vectors in this set capital S. Okay, so this is a set, and it will contain absolutely all things of the form C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus all the way up to Cn, Vn, where these Cis are elements of the field capital F. Okay, so structures of this form here, where we have all of these C's elements of the field, 
Okay, and we've multiplied each one of the vectors in our set capital S by some scalar in the field. So we scalar multiplied each one of the vectors by some element of the field and then added them all together. Things of that form are called linear combinations of the n vectors here. And the span of S is then the set that contains all the near combinations of the vectors in that set S. Okay, so that to make this absolutely clear, what you have to do is put in every single element of your field, capital F, in for C1. For every single element of the field that you put in this position C1, you then have to let C2 take on every single element of the field. For every combination of two elements of the field, C1 and C2, you then have to let C3 vary over all elements of the field, and so on. So you have to let all of these vary over every single element of the field. You have to take every possible combination that there is of n elements of the field. Okay, Work out what this uh, linear combination with that combination of uh, elements of the field is actually going to be equal to, and it will always be an element of the vector space, because whenever you scale or multiply a, a vector in the vector space by some element of the field, you get another vector in the vector space. So all of these things are going to be elements of the vector space, and then we're just adding them all together. So we'll still end up with something that's in the vector space. Okay, you, so you get all these answers, which are vectors in the vector space. Stick them all into this great big set, and that is what is meant by the span of this set of vectors, S. Okay, so it's all linear combinations of the vectors in that set, S. Okay, so for the vector space then to be a finite dimensional vector space, there must be a subset, a finite subset of vectors in from that vector space, which um, it is true that the span of that, i.e. the set containing all linear combinations, uh, is the entire vector space. Okay, so every vector in the vector space must be able to be expressed by uh, a linear combination of a finite set of vectors. Okay, right, so what I now want to do then, the first thing I want to prove is that if this is the case, so if we are working with a finite dimensional vector space, um, I want to prove that you can always find a basis for that finite dimensional vector space. So firstly what I want to do is just remind you of what the definition of a basis actually is. It's something that we defined in an earlier video on this playlist on vector spaces, but I'll go over it again here. Uh, and then what I want to do is prove that if our vector space obeys this criterion uh, of finite dimensionalness, uh, then uh, we will actually always be able to construct a basis. And indeed, I'll show you exactly how to construct a basis. Okay, so let me firstly remind you of what is meant by a basis for a vector space. Okay, uh, now, uh, a basis of a vector space then, it is first and foremostly a subset of the elements of the vector space. Okay, so we'll denote this subset capital B, and it's a subset of the vector space capital V. Okay, and it has to obey two properties. Now, for all of what we're going to discuss for finite dimensional vector spaces, bases are going to have a finite number of elements in. Okay, now it can be generalized. Uh, basis, the concept of a basis doesn't necessarily have to be a finite set, but for our purposes we are doing a video on finite dimensional vector spaces and all of our bases are going to be finite sets. So I'm going to explicitly write out B is equal to a set of vectors. Okay, so again, it will be a set of vectors V1, V2, all the way up to Vn. Okay, where I'm not meaning to imply that they're the exact same vectors we had up here. I'm just using the same notation. It's just a set of vectors from the vector space. Uh, okay, and we've got a finite number of them. However, uh, the definition of a basis doesn't say that it has to be a finite set of vectors, and indeed in the topic of infinite dimensional vector spaces, you, you the concept of a basis is still a big, big important concept. Okay, uh, But we are discussing finite dimensional vector spaces, so our bases are indeed going to be finite sets of vectors. Okay, so we've got a finite set of vectors here. Okay, um, and it has to have two special properties. The first is that the span of the basis has to equal the entire vector space. Okay, so we know exactly what that means. That means the set containing all linear combinations of these basis vectors, the vectors in the basis, has to be equal to the entire vector space. So all vectors in the vector space have to be 
expressible as a linear combination of the basis vectors. Okay, so that's condition number one that a basis must satisfy. Condition number two then that a basis must satisfy is that it's linearly independent. Now let me remind you of what is meant by linearly independent. Again, it is a concept that we addressed in an earlier video in this playlist, but I will remind you of what it means here. So if a set of vectors is linearly independent, what it means is that there is only one linear combination of that set of vectors which gives you the zero vector. Okay, so if you want to take a linear combination of the set of vectors C1, V1, plus C2, V2, plus all the way up to Cn, Vn, okay, and you want this linear combination to equal the zero vector, there is only one linear combination that can do that if the set of vectors is linearly independent. That's the definition of a set of vectors being linearly independent, that there is only one linear combination of uh, the set of vectors which gives you as the answer the zero vector, the additive identity for the vector space. Okay, and that linear combination is the trivial one, where all of the elements of the field, all of the scalars that you're multiplying your vectors by, are zero, the additive identity in the field. Okay, now, if you put in, as for all of the CIs here, so C1, C2, C3, all the way up to CN, if you put in the additive identity of the field, zero in the field, uh, then you are scalar multiplying all of these vectors of the basis by uh, zero, and we know that uh, whenever you scale and multiply a vector by the additive identity of a field uh, in a vector space, it will give you the zero vector. So all of these things, and I'll just color them in, so C1, V1, C2, V2, all of these scalar multiples of our basis vectors, they'll all equal the zero vector when the CIs are at the additive identity in the field. So we'll just be adding n lots of the zero vector together. So of course, that will always give us the zero vector as the overall answer. Okay, so whatever set of vectors you take, it's always the case that if you set all of the scalar multiples to the additive identity in the field, zero in the field, that you'll get the zero vector. The condition for the set of vectors to be linearly independent is that this is the only way of getting the zero vector. This is the only linear combination which gives the zero vector. Okay, and we discuss in the video on linear independence that as soon as this is true for a set of vectors, so as soon as a set of vectors is linearly independent, what it means is that all the different linear combinations of the uh, set of vectors are distinct vectors in the vector space. So when you work out what a linear combination of the set of linearly independent vectors is equal to, if you've got two different linear combinations, they will not be the same vector. Okay, so for every single different linear combination you take, you will get a different vector in the vector space as soon as this is true. So if all of these vectors are linearly independent, then when you consider the span of that set of vectors, every different linear combination will give a different vector in the vector space, i.e. there's no redundancy, there's no degeneracy. Every single different linear combination will give a different vector in the vector space. Okay, and these two criteria together give bases very, very nice uh, properties. Okay, because what this now means is that if I have any vector in the vector space, so let's say little v is just some arbitrary vector in the vector space, capital V. Okay, I can now express little v and I'll just move this up a little bit, I can now express little v as a linear combination of my basis vectors. Okay, so because the basis spans the entire vector space, it is always true that I can express little v as a linear combination of my basis vectors. So I'll be able to write it as some c1 times v1 plus c2 times v2 plus all the way up to cn times vn. So this bit tells me that I can always write any vector in the vector space as a linear combination of the basis vectors. Then the second condition of being linearly independent says that this is the only way that you can write v as a linear combination of the basis vectors. Okay, so together these make it the case that every vector in the vector space can be written as a linear combination of the basis vectors in one and only one way. So this is the one bit, this is the only one bit. Okay, so there is only one linear combination of the basis vectors which will give this vector v because uh, we insist that the basis has to be linearly independent.
Okay, so that's the beautiful property of a basis that it allows us to write every single vector in the vector space as a linear combination of the basis vectors in one and only one way. Okay, right, we will have a break here and then in the next video what we will do is prove that for a finite dimensional vector space you can always construct a basis, you can always find a basis which will have a finite number of elements in it. Okay, so that's what we'll do in the next video.